Okay, hey guys, welcome to the channel. So this is the first study by um, Kandi et al. 2000, it was the first study in the biological approach. It's a brain scanning study, looking at the links between amygdala and memory for emotional experiences. So this is more of a revision and recap lesson. Um, this is, I've recommended a few resources which are um, better for you to understand or get a better comprehensive understanding of the entire chapter. This is more of a way that you could test yourself and help you to memorize the small details. So at, um, feel free to stop at any point before the information is displayed and try to answer the um, small questions to see how much you understand. Okay, so what's the background of the study? So what the amygdala is, right? And how it's related to the study. So the amygdala is an almond shaped set of neurons located deep in the brain's medial temporal lobe and has been shown to play a key role in the processing of emotions such as pleasure, fear, and anger. And more importantly, it's also responsible for determine, determining where memories are stored in the brain and which ones are kept. Okay, so what has previous research shown? So it has shown that emotional experiences are better recalled because emotional arousal increases likelihood of memory consolidation during storage of memory. And then the second part is Greater amygdala activation for emotional state from it, for emotional stimulus results in better memory of these events. This was Kanli's first research, but he wanted to rep repeat it with the repeated measures designed to rule out the possibility of individual uh, differences. Okay. Okay, let's continue. So, what's a, what, what, how do fMRI machines work? Because they were used in the study. So they use MRI technology and they pick up information associated with blood flow, which is a non-invasive brain scanning technique. So parts of the blood, uh, sorry, parts of the brain are more active, so they receive more blood. So there's greater blood flow and the scanner will pick up this information to produce a map of squares called voxels. And then this is known as blood oxygen level dependent imaging. And voxels is within the region of interest, which was particularly the amygdala, was color coded according to level of activation. So was the experimental design? It was a repeated measure design because in the first part, they looked at pictures in the fMRI and during the second part, they came for an uh, unexpected recall task. Experiment type, so it was a liberty experiment because the part environment the participants were tested in was not comparable to everyday situation. And even um, the use of fMRIs, it was well equipped with fMRI also limits the realism, which we'll talk about later in the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the study. So it was, um, so what's the independent variable? It was emotional intensity of the 96 scenes, which were presented to the participant in the fMRI scanner. And the independent variable was participants of the, uh, participants' memory of the stimuli in the unexpected recall task, whether they uh, replied to uh, remembering the image with certain deep familiarity or they could not remember the image at all. And fMRI measure of amygdala activation. So sample and sampling. So. The sample consisted of 10 right-handed healthy female individuals and it was volunteer sampling. And reasons for the sample. So in the research paper, it was said that females show more physiological response to stimuli and are more likely to report intense emotional experiences. So this is um, the reasoning for the sample chosen from the original research paper. So what's the aim of the study? Okay, so, sorry. Uh, it was to prove that emotive images will be remembered better than those that have little emotional impact on an individual. It was also to investigate if amygdala is sensitive to varying degrees of emotional intensity. And lastly, to investigate if varying degrees of emotional intensity affected amygdala's role in enhancing memory of stimulus. Okay, so what was the first part of the procedure? So, one second. So basically during the first part of the procedure, so this was when they were situated in the fMRI scanner. So participants viewed a series of 96 images that were presented by an overhead projector and mirror to allow them to see it while they were in the fMRI. So all of them had given informed consent to be involved in the study and they were aware of the nature of the experiment. So all the 96 images, they were from the International Effective Picture System, similar set. For these scenes this, uh, in, this, in this study, the average ratings for valence range from 1.17 to 5.44, which was highly negative to neutral. And the order of the scenes were randomized 
for all participants and each picture was presented for exactly 2.88 seconds. Then there was an interval of 12.96 seconds where the participants were made to view a fixation cross. Um, during this, participants were instructed to view, the, view each picture during the entire 2.88 seconds. And then after its replacement with the fixation cross, they were indicated to, they were told to indicate the emotional arousal by pressing a button with their right hand. And they had to uh, rate it on a scale of zero to three, um, with zero being not emotionally intense at all and three being extremely emotionally intense. Okay, I'll just stop for a second. All oh, right, and the arousal of the images, I just forgot to include that part. So it ranged from 1.97 to 7.63, it was tranquil to seven, uh, highly arousing. So valence is about how negative and uh, of how positive the image is images are, and if you could see that there's no, uh, it lacks a lot of positive imagery. And arousal is basically the intensity of emotion experience upon uh, looking at the image. So this is just a summary of the IV and DV. And this is a scale that they use to um, measure emotional, emotional arousal. And this is about the, um, in the stimulus period, according to a research paper, just pause it and take note if you haven't, if you have not really taken note of this. So, what's the second part of the procedure? Right. So, after three weeks, participants were tested in an unexpected recognition test. So, take note, it was unexpected, so they were not informed of it. So, during the task, they viewed all of the ninety-six previous scenes, and then there was another forty-eight foils. So, these were new scenes. And these foils were selected to match the previously presented scenes in their valence and arousal characteristics. Then participants were asked whether they had seen each image before. And they were asked, um, they, sorry. And then they were asked to um, reply using three options, which was they saw it with familiarity, or they were certain they had seen it, or they had not, they were sure that they had not seen the image at all. Right, and then they created a correlational map and then did some data analysis. And just take note that the study is a correlational study. So uh, if you write cause and effect, you would be marked down. So what were the results? So basically it, they showed that amygdala activation is significantly bilaterally correlated with higher ratings of individually experienced emotional intensity. Scenes rated zero to two had homogeneous distribution or similar distribution of number of items which were forgotten, familiar, and remembered. And scenes rated three were considered more memorable because lesser scenes rated three were forgotten and more of them were remembered. And activation of left amygdala was predictive of whether images would appear familiar, whether they would be remembered or they would be forgotten. Okay, so you could see the point about um, for scenes rated zero to two, zero, one, and two, they had similar distributions of the images that were forgotten, familiar, and remembered. And notice how the scenes in three were mostly remembered and very few of them were forgotten. So what are the conclusions? So they basically concluded that amygdala is sensitive to varying degrees of emotional, sorry, uh, amygdala activation is sensitive to varying degrees of individually experienced emotional intensity and activation of left but not of amygdala is uh, predictive of subsequent recall of stimulus. So let's get into the evaluation of this study. So what were the strengths and weakness? So the main, sorry. So the main method was laboratory experiment. So all the participants were tested in a standardized environment. They were given the same items to read. The procedure was standardized as well. So for example, you could talk about the 2.88 seconds of the each picture being displayed, 12.96 for the interstimulus period. So you could say that the study has high reliability because it's very highly standardized. You could also say it's highly high has high internal validity because it reduces extraneous variables. So because there are fewer confounding and extraneous variables affecting the study. Um, next, we can also talk about repeated measure design. So it helps to eliminate participant variables. Um, you can talk about um, the fMRI because, excuse me. So you can talk about how it collects quantitative data. So it's objective. It can be easily statistically analyzed. fMRI or is also a scientific apparatus, so it's highly valid. 
because there's lesser chance of error or in the data. Okay, so what are the weakness? So there's only quantitative data. So it cannot explain why participants chose a particular rating as the emotional intensity. So the, the images that they rated on zero to three. So why did some people pick three while others may have picked one, for example? So the sample list, the sample is just generally about uh, being able to generalize the data. So was it was was the did, did, did the study allow um, their findings to be generalizable? Not really, right? Because there was only females. There's a very small sample size then. And although this does sound kind of um, dumb, you could say that there's only right-handed people, but are you sure that you could um, generalize data to left-handed people? And it was volunteer sampling as well. So they were all from the same location. So they could have, uh, all the people who replied could have similar characteristics, sorry. So, they could reduce the generalizability of the data. So ecological validity, right? So why was it low? So they were being scanned in an fMRI scanner, so it's hardly ecologically valid, right? So, so there was also a control lab, it was an artificial environment. So but do you think that the um, images of negative valence was or was representative of images of being able to um, see that exact event in real life? And what about images of positive valence? Um, do you think that the findings of the study can um, talk about images which have which are which have positive imagery? Ethics. So negative. They were shown a lot of negative imagery, so it could have resulted in stress or psychological harm. So they're not protected for that. And positive valence imagery. So why could they have shown this? So basically, if they had shown them negative images, so by showing them positive images, do you think that would help to elevate their negative mental state? It could be possible, it could be um, done during debriefing. So there was also deception. So because there was an unexpected recall task, despite the fact that they, they were volunteered and they had obtained informed consent, um, they were still not informed about they were gonna take part in an unexpected recall task. So they, they could say that there was some aspect of deception. Okay, so like, like I had said that this is more of like a recap lesson. So I would recommend a few um, sites which you could um, use to get better in, um, information. So on YouTube, there's these YouTube channels, CIA level psychology and Cambridge A level psychology. They make excellent videos. Um, it's a more comprehensive understanding and websites such as Excelling Psychology and Simply Psychology. Um, especially for the research research methods chapter. They provide a lot of information about ethics and they are generally very helpful. And I would also recommend that you read the research papers, the original research papers, take points from that because at certain parts in the uh, previous papers that they've asked directly, questions directly from the research paper, so which the textbook does not provide. All right, that'll be all for today. And I'll, uh, be, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.